On today's World Insight, India is poised to surpass China as the world's most populous nation. How can these two nations take advantage of their demographic dividend? Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. This month, India is expected to overtake China as the world's most populous country. This comes after China reported in January that its population has dropped for the first time in six decades. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin stressed that while the size of the population is important, talent and quality are even more crucial. Does China's progress in education, innovation and workforce participation give its human capital an edge for China's future development? How will China remain an attractive destination for international investment for decades to come? We speak to our panelists to find out. We are joined in Beijing, Zheng Zhenzhen, professor with the Institute of Population and Labor Economics with Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And in Vancouver, Svaran Singh, visiting professor at Department of Political Science in University of British Columbia. He's originally coming from India. Thank you so much for both of you joining us. Now, the population size, there's likely to be the ch a change as to who is the big biggest, but uh, to uh, Dr. Singh, tell me more about how India is looking at the possibility it's going to be the most populous country in the world. Now, I think international media is making a bit of a too much of a hype around uh, this transition. And uh, I dare say maybe some of them are trying to put it as if India versus China. Uh, first of all, uh, most of these are broad estimates. Uh, and these estimates are saying that China's population is going to be lesser than India by about 2.5 million people. Now, if you look at total China and India put together, that reaches to uh, you know 2.5 billion people. Uh, it's a margin of error which is extremely small. Uh, even if we take that projection to be true, the second problem here is that these estimates do not include either Hong Kong Autonomous Region or Macau Autonomous Region, which together is 8 million people, oh, yeah. which is way beyond, which is much more than 2.5 million people that we are saying India is going to exceed. And third point, of course, is the Chinese as well claim Thailand to be part of China. Now, what about that? Another 24 million people. And so okay. I, I think we should be careful as we estimate these things. Right. Second important point is that both are large populations. I mean, they, this is not a hugely new thing for them. It was on expected lines. This symbolizes mm. prosperity that China has achieved. Most countries, when they become prosperous, fertility rates go down. So that, that is what is happening. It is something which was All in right. anticipation, and people are both sides prepared to deal with it. Uh, Professor Zhang, what do you make of the so-called uh, media hype, as Dr. Singh just suggested? Uh, actually, if you're looking at the third place in the world, it's just 0.3 billion. So it is not comparable. I, I, I think it, there, there's a, uh, it is not a big issue, actually. Uh, and also, this, uh, we call it, uh, if you call it a great cross, however, it is predicted uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, we, we already know there right. will be the situation. So it's very and, interesting as to how the media is trying to shape it, frame it. And also some uh, are trying to use it strategically. Uh, why do you see as population experts and geopolitical experts, people are trying to make a, a fuss out of this? Professor Zhang. Well, I, I, I think the media catch everything change, right, as a news. But however, I, I think um, theoretically, population size is not really directly related to development or GDP growth, right? There is no direct relationship. So uh, actually, institutional arrangement policies and the economic market, that, that is more important and uh, right. also in China em employment. 
I would love to go into details about this, Professor Zheng. As a result of that, what you just suggested, what do you see is the biggest challenge facing China's uh, population? I think those challenges brought by population dynamics and also brought by modernization. So uh, I, I think it is natural to see these changes. If there is no change, I think it's not normal. <laughs> However, those, those changes uh, brought challenge because we are not only to have an aging population, we will have a aged aging population and we will have a aging labor force and and uh, we already experienced the labor force drop uh 10 years ago so uh i i think china has to learn to adapt to this population structure mm -hmm. we have used to uh, uh have a young population and, and the whole society practice is different and we have to change. We have to realize that it is not only the government responsibility, but also the whole society, every individual have mm. to be aware of that. Let me go to you, Dr. Singh, Professor Singh. Also, on the Indian side, with the becoming the largest population in the world, there's always the issue of providing jobs for the young people, of course, uh, food for everyone, shelters as well. And meanwhile, how to make sure the population's education uh, will be up to standards. All these could be uh, challenges. China faced that in the earlier decades. Now it's India's turn. It's a psychological moment uh, to be declared as a country with the largest population. But it's not something that has come as a news to us. Uh, uh, people in India and government of India uh, we're well aware and we are already a very large population country. Uh, so some of those initiatives uh, have already been put in place. Uh, for example, almost a decade back, India started something called a Ministry of Skill Development uh, at the central union government level. And that means the focus clearly was to enhance people's skills. Of course, we have a very uh, powerful and large Ministry of Education a Ministry of Family Welfare. So these are initiatives which were already put in place, knowing that India is a large population, it is growing population, India's uh, young population is going to be uh, demanding of uh, opportunities and therefore employment will be something which will have to be focused. Uh, so uh, entrepreneurship is something which is being encouraged for last uh, seven, eight years. Uh, that people don't just sit down and, and, you know, gain education and then claim for employment. They should be themselves empowered to create more employment for other people. Mm. And that kind of several schemes are put in place. Another very important area is women empowerment in India. For example, Chinese have a very impressive record on that. Uh, I think it's twice the global average that women are employed in terms of percentage of population when it comes to China. Uh, India has been focusing on that. Half the population is women. So how to bring women into uh, the mainstream and make them productive? So it's both, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Chinese Premier Li Qiang talks of talent dividend, dividend and of course, uh, uh, population and, uh, demographic dividend. So these have to be merged together. And my very quick last point on this is the global trend is shifting now from manufacturing being the driver of growth to services becoming the driver of growth. And India has already earned a certain name in providing services, uh, particularly uh, IT services in that sense. And when we move from manufacturing to IT, uh, longevity is not a liability. Longevity becomes an asset because people can continue to be productive for a relatively longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And therefore, aging population is not necessarily a liability. Of course, beyond a certain age, they will become dependent. So that kind of uh, the focus on maintain, maintenance of health and welfare of those people will have to be taken yeah. care of. So broadly, it means that you know younger people will have to prepare themselves for dealing with increasing larger number of age, age, aged people. Uh, but several European countries, uh, developed countries have uh, already shown okay. that that is a possibility and India and China will also do that likewise. Mm. About the youth employment, that is the biggest issue, I guess, facing both India and China. Meanwhile, other countries as well, especially the global economy is struggling and restructuring right now. 
Professor Zhang, uh, from China's perspective, how do you see the practices to create jobs and to empower youth, and at the same time to make sure that the general environment will be um, cordial to the growth of the younger population in terms of uh, employment are, are, are actually accommodating? Well, I, I, I think this is a big challenge. We just learned that, that uh, the youth uh, unemployment rate was very high uh, uh, early this year. I, I think in some, some uh, impacts of the three years uh, uh, pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic, but also I, I think there's more and more uh, university graduates. They are looking for some job. They are they are going to feel satisfactory, but they couldn't find the satisfactory jobs and, and they just wait. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, issues need to be dealt with. And I have seen the uh, efforts of the government to create more jobs and, uh, and also I think to uh, guide the young people um, to be employed, to find their uh, suitable job, and to create their own business. Mm. But I think it is a very tough task. About rural urban migration issue, China experienced that. 30 years ago, starting, shall I say, uh, Ms. Zheng. Um, and we see uh, dramatic social changes in this country. So um, is there something, as a population expert, you can share with your Indian counterpart? Well, I, I think actually we're doing almost uh, more or less the same way, but in different time frame and in different style. Uh, I observed that, that India also has a very large population uh, moving from rural to urban uh, to uh, to make their career and uh, to earn more money. But in in China, it is also I I think the the situation uh, quite the same. Uh, but but it's uh, for for China, it's also uh, concentrated in the coastal uh, areas attracts uh, young population. But today. We saw uh, the young people select destination and uh, not because of high income, because of uh, the place can make them more comfortable to live. So mm -hmm. the place with a high education investment, the better public service and more friendly migration uh, policies can attract more young people. So I, I think now today, uh, uh, every city, I, I believe the local government try to attract the young talents by better policies. In China, we used to have separate public service uh, uh, to local residents and to migrants. And that makes uh, the migrants feel they are the second class citizens or netizens. And so, so I, I, I think that is some uh, uh, experience, uh, some lessons we we learned, and we found we observed that uh, with with the place that people leave the place, not so friendly to them, and then that place will suffer the the labor shortage, and now we are uh, encouraging uh, the urbanization of people-centered urbanization, I think that is the correction to the uh, some practices 30 years ago, only looking at the uh, economic growth. Professor Singh, there must be some takeaways uh, listening to Professor Zheng's words. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Zheng is actually an expert on population studies. And China being uh, an equally large population country next door to India, but more important, also a developing country, of course, much developed compared to India, but uh, also ancient civilization. So there are a lot of things 
that uh, India can definitely learn from China's uh, experience and experiments. Uh, but I also want to underline in large countries like China and India, it's not easy to take modernization and development and material development to the last corner of uh, our, our countries. Uh, and therefore, it's natural that development uh, coincides with urbanization. Uh, so some of the cities will draw people uh, from outside, from rural areas, and all of them will feel uh, relatively uh, dispossessed, if not second-class citizens, as uh, Professor Chang says, uh, because they are uprooting themselves from one settlement where they have lived for generations to another place, which is a strange place for them. So they do have their challenges. Uh, among several things that India has sought to achieve to reduce that flow of population to urban centers is to encourage satellite towns, smaller towns uh, around the country. So uh, Indian Prime Minister, for example, has had uh, digitization focus and making smart cities. Hundred such cities have been picked up to encourage them in terms of providing them with, providing them with material infrastructure, mm -hmm. internet access and things like that, opening educational institutions there. Uh, promoting religious centers, if there are religious centers in that area, into tourism industry focus. So there is an effort, but it is not to deny that, yes, there is definitely a flow of population to big me metro me megapolis cities like uh, Mumbai or New Delhi or uh, Calcutta or Chennai. Uh, and that throws up its own challenges of uh, suddenly a certain uh, people, uh, number of people come in who don't have their own establishment in that uh, metrop metropolitan area. Yeah. And they have to be provided with those facilities. So housing for all, for example, has been the focus of Indian Prime Minister. Water for all has been the focus of Indian government for the last seven to eight years. So efforts are being made in that direction. And to a certain extent, yes, achievements have also been visible in that direction. But hmm. uh, again, the point I'm underlining is that this India becoming largest population potentially in middle of this year is not something that is completely taking everybody by surprise. Chinese new and India's new. Right. Already our growth, our growth of population curves have been reducing over a period of time. It's only that China's development has happened faster, so their fertility rate is going slower, relatively faster compared to India. India's fertility growth will also sort of slow down over a period of time, and the countries understand that this is a natural process. About the quality of the population, uh, Professor Zheng, uh, education in China has been going through quite a number of cycles of uh, experiments. Uh, earlier, you see more universities being set up, so you have huge numbers of people uh, graduated from universities. This is not the same decades ago, and that gives a dramatic change to the quality of the population but at the same time to the employment demands of the young population. So how do you see, Professor Zhang, uh, this change? And meanwhile, as China uh, try to further develop and, um, and try to complement the earlier uh, system, how do you see the adjustment can be done? Actually, I should say, in my opinion, uh, the industry uh, uh, and the, the way of employment, uh, recruitment, and the, and, and the uh, workplace training are not fast enough to catch up such a large change. And also, there is a mismatch, I think, in the uh, college graduates and the, the job available. And so uh, I, I, I think that this uh, education expansion I think it is very successful. Now, um, I think uh, more than 90% of the young people can have uh, high school education. And the issue is uh, how they can find a suitable job. And, and uh, they need to uh, justify the job they are looking for. Although I, I think there, there is a time lag between the change and the reality, but I think this situation is, is fine because uh, we, not, we are not only looking at the graduates right now, but we need to think of that uh, they will work for the next 30 years. Many of the college graduates, once they graduate from universities, 
three or four years, their knowledge learned earlier already expired, you know, because the upgrades of technologies. So that comes to the core issue of education of uh, education quality. Yes, I, I think the education is not, uh, today a lot of people talk about school education. I think uh, workplace education and, uh, and re-education, re-training is also mm. important and the lifelong learning is also important because in China, the uh, middle-aged and the older labor force growing very fast. They need to learn also, they need to be trained to uh, suit the current high technology job. Mm. Go to you, Professor Singh. Um, how do you see the education in India can be able to uh, help the ever increasing population, especially the young population? You know, yes. Uh, there is still enormous uh, uh, low levels of per capita in, in, in India. Um, but China and India both fully understand what is called purchasing power parity. Uh, so in purchasing power parity, India already stands as the third largest economy on the planet. Uh, in, in China, of course, is number one uh, in that terms. So uh, the purchasing power of even low incomes of people, if they stay within India, is very different. Uh, compared to the World Bank often emphasizing on $1.25 and, and you know that kind of measurement uh, really do not tell us the truth that happens on the ground in India. Uh, so there are challenges and I think India is focusing on creating that opportunities and you see Chinese mm -hmm. and Indian smartest people very often are going around the world and taking on very very significant positions around the world both as entrepreneurs yeah. and as uh, market leaders. Uh, so opportunities are not limited uh, only within the country. The whole world is now open for Indians and Chinese to go and explore and establish their uh, credentials as, as great entrepreneurs and great skilled mm. people around the world. Common prosperity was a concept that being talked about in China a lot. Uh, Professor Zheng, of course, from now until common prosperity being achieved, there is still a lot of time to go. Uh, well, in India, of course, uh, wealth gap is a big issue that we know for some time already. So how do you see, well, the population, the demographic changes are taking place in the countries, both the countries. Uh, both countries are going to uh, deal with uh, these challenges while at the same time trying to fix the common prosperity issue, quote unquote. Uh, President Xi Jinping has promised that if a young man wants to work hard, China should create opportunities such that he should be able to reach at least the middle class level. Likewise in India, if you measure India's middle class or China's middle class, I believe China's middle class has now reached about 500 million, India's middle class has reached about 350 million people. These are the aspirational and younger people who are willing to do something and achieve something within their lifetime. And they do have opportunities, which is not to say that India still does not have challenges of poverty, which of course China believes uh, that they have eliminated acute poverty. So some of those challenges, the large population throws up to India definitely. Uh, but uh, you know, the infusion of technology and therefore mixture of demographic dividend with the talent dividend, when you mix these and blend them together, I think maximizes possibilities of India being able to provide better life to all Indians uh, if they begin to work hard. And a very quick final point, China has, as you mentioned, reached a certain level of prosperity. So the focus now is on equity and justice very clearly. India is at still another stage, which is prosperity is right now the focus. So uh, yes, there is an increasing uh, kind of uh, increasing difference between the rich and the poor in, in some sense. Uh, but once India has also reached a certain level of prosperity, I think then equity and justice will become much stronger focus, which is not to say that it is not the focus now. But yes, I think that that area is something which will come a few years later when the total focus I will see. shift from prosperity to equity and justice. Professor Zhang, the issue for China. Well, I, I think it's a big challenge when we're looking at the um, demographic uh, uh, prospects and uh, in the future change up to 2050. And uh, while we are uh, intend trying to reach the common uh, prosperity and uh, the goal in 2050, and uh, we are fast aging. 
So I, I think we, uh, if we learn our experience from the past, we have enjoyed the, the population dividend in the last 30 years because we have a better policy, uh, the coincidence of uh, opening up and reform and a large share of uh, labor force population. So I think in the future, we also need to uh, identify a new demographic windows and opportunities. For example, as people talking about second demographic dividend, uh, when in the aging population, uh, we have to have certain institutional and policy reform to catch the new opportunity. For example, the postponement of retirement and the pension reform, I think it is very important because we have a growing number of uh, popula uh, labor force population between age 50 and 70. And, and now also uh, we have a different retirement age for men and women. It is a big waste uh, for uh, uh, human resource uh, uh, let women retire at age 50 and spend another 30 years not working. <laughs> and uh, also a lot of uh, skilled people, skilled workers. So I think this reform is going on, is on the way, but I think we should do it very fast because mm -hmm. uh, the, the population change is uh, faster than the policy responsibilities always. Mm -hmm. Zheng Zhenzhen, Swaran Singh, thank you so much for joining us. All the best. And that's all the time we have for today. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye for now.